Thank you for joining us for this MDA Engage community webinar on your future, your family, and neuromuscular disease. My name is Nicole Petrowski, and I'm the Community Education Specialist at MDA, and we're thrilled to have you join us today. This webinar is part of our larger MDA Engage flagship community event series, which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and social opportunities. Be sure to visit, visit the community education section on mda.org for updates on upcoming virtual events. And I just wanted to go over some objectives that we are going to go over today. We will explore what family planning involves and we will review genetic makeup of some neuromuscular diseases. And I would now like to introduce, excuse me, our speaker for today, Jordan Bontrager. Jordan is a certified genetic counselor at the University of Rochester Medical Center based in Rochester, New York. She graduated with her master's of science degree in medical genetics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2016. Her background includes clinical and laboratory genetic counseling focused on neurologic and metabolic disease. She currently works as a clinical genetic counselor within the Neuromuscular Disease Center at URMC and provides genetic counseling services for patients with a variety of neuromuscular disorders. So Jordan, thank you so much for being with us. I will go ahead and have you present your slides. Great, well thank you Nicole for that introduction. I am extremely excited to be here to speak with you all today and I'm very thankful for your time in talking about this important topic of family planning in the context of neuromuscular disease. Um, I am hoping that there'll be plenty of questions. I'm leaving plenty of time towards the end. So I would encourage all of you to make sure that you're submitting your questions as you go along and I will do my absolute best to address those um, towards the end when we, when we have some time. But um, I'm hoping that you guys have some great questions, which I'm assuming you will. Oops, okay. So today my plan is to give a broad overview of neuromuscular disorders, including how these diseases are inherited in families, go into how individuals with a family history of neuromuscular disease can use this information when family planning, and present a case example of family planning in the context of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and then finally give an overview of the practical steps that are necessary for family planning when there is a known family history of neuromuscular disease. I don't have any disclosures. So to get into kind of the basics overview here, inherited neuromuscular diseases encompasses a wide group of disorders that can look very different in terms of symptoms, age of onset, progression, and severity based on what type of disease it is and the underlying cause. So in talking about neuromuscular diseases, I just want to caveat that this is a huge catch-all term that can include muscular dystrophies, myopathies, um, motor neuron diseases, myotonic dystrophy, hereditary neuropathies. And as many of you might know, these are, are very different disorders. So um, this is, again, a very broad term, but um, as you'll see, they, th this can look very different based on what the actual genetic cause of disease is, how it's inherited in a family. Um, and each of these kind of categories that you see here can be broken down into much smaller categories based on the gene of interest and the specific diagnosis. There is an estimated prevalence of overarching inherited neuromuscular disease of about 1 in 3,500. Um, this is likely, I believe, an underestimate of the prevalence of neuromuscular diseases because many of these do have a later onset adult form. So I think this prevalence number is looking more into kind of childhood onset or more overt disease versus individuals that might have a mild neuromuscular disease that wouldn't be included in this prevalence number. All of that to say that I wager to bet that this prevalence number is actually higher than stated here. Neuromuscular diseases can be inherited in really any fashion um, possible in terms of a genetic inheritance. So because this is such a broad group of disorders, we really see every different type of inheritance pattern, including autosomal dominant, recessive, and X-linked, or genes that are on the X chromosome. Today, I'm planning on going into a little bit more detail about these first three inheritance patterns, dominant, recessive, and X-linked. Um, I did want to mention that 
there is mitochondrial um, component to neuromuscular disease as well. So our mitochondria have our, it, it, their own special set of DNA and mutations or changes within that DNA can cause neuromuscular disease because mitochondria are, play a big role in muscle function. However, this is a, a very complex subject that I think really warrants its own talk of its own. Um, I'll touch upon some limitations that come with family planning with mitochondrial disease, but I'm not going to go into any significant detail about how these are inherited. So to start with a quick overview of how genetic diseases are inherited in general, I wanted to kind of go back to an image that many of you may have seen, whether it was in you know, high school biology, or maybe you saw this in a genetic counseling session, or maybe this is the first time that you've seen this. But this is a picture of uh, the human chromosome, set of chromosomes. So as you can see here, most humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So the first 22 pairs look the same. So the pairs make sense because we get one from mom and one from dad from each, for each of these numbered chromosomes. Um, the first 22 pairs here have identical genes on them. So you have genes that are housed on these chromosomes and you have two copies of every gene that's on the first of these 22. The last set of chromosomes are sex chromosomes. So females have two X chromosomes and therefore have two copies of all genes on that chromosome, whereas males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome and therefore only have one copy of genes that are housed on the X chromosome. This will come into play when we talk about X-linked diseases. So just remembering that males do only have one copy of all genes that are on the X chromosome. When I think about chromosomes, I often like to compare them to a very large book of recipes that probably sits on your counter and maybe you never ever look at. <laughs> um, so I know I have you know, a big cookbook at home that, that I don't look at frequently, but has lots and lots of recipes in it. And I think of chromosomes as, as being kind of like that. So if this blue picture here is a, a set of chromosomes, again, one from mom and one from dad, thinking of that as being our large cookbook of instructions or of recipes. If we narrow in and we look on a gene level, this red here, again, two copies, one from mom and one from dad, represents a gene. And a gene is one particular instruction for our body, similar to how in a cookbook, a recipe is one particular instruction that we would follow to make a product, a cookie, a muffin, et cetera. A gene is one particular instruction for our body that typically tells it how to make one product, which is typically a protein. If we further looked at a gene, we would see that it's made up of DNA and DNA is broken down into a string of nucleotides, which for all intents and purposes, you can think of as being a spelling code here. So you can see that it's made up of a string of C, G, T's, and A's, and they're in different orders. Our body is able to read that information and then make a protein, similar to if you were reading a recipe and making that recipe. Um, you would read it, make that cookie recipe, etc. Our body reads this and is able to then make the protein that it needs to make to function the way that it should. Sometimes there can be changes within the DNA code, whether it's a big missing chunk of DNA, an extra chunk of DNA, or just a small spelling change in that DNA that can cause that instruction to not work the way that it should. So again, coming back to that recipe analogy, let's say there is a cookie recipe and it's missing butter, you're not going to make cookies. It's going to be a mess. So Similar to that, if there's a missing or erroneous piece of DNA, it's possible that the protein that it's meant to make will not work the way that it should. And in diving in a bit more about the inheritance patterns of neuromuscular diseases, I'm going to start by going over dominant inheritance. And this is called the autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning that this is in regards to genes that are on those first 22 chromosomes. So in those conditions, every person has two copies of all of those genes, um, males and females. So what you see in dominant conditions is that if the blue is representing a normal copy of the gene or one that is working the way that it should, and orange is, is representing an abnormal or mutated copy of that gene, 
an individual with one copy of that gene that is not working correctly has disease symptoms. So you can see here that this affected father has one non-working copy of the gene here and one working copy of the gene here in blue. And when individuals with dominant disease have children, there's a 50% chance that they pass along this non-working copy of the gene and a 50% chance that they pass along this working copy. And given the other copy that's coming from mom is going to be normal, there's a 50% chance that with each pregnancy that a child could be affected with the same condition as the affected parent. So for dominant diseases, oftentimes we're seeing multiple generations of affected individuals with multiple affected individuals in each generation. So you might see a grandfather, an uncle, an aunt, and then multiple affected children. So you're seeing in multiple generations that this is being passed down and it's really a flip of a coin with each child of an affected individual, whether their ch child will have the same condition. Some example of dominant neuromuscular diseases are, are outlined here. So FSHD, myotonic dystrophy, um, some of the myotonias, hereditary spastic paraplegia, charcot marie tooth familial ALS, there are dominant myopathies. This is definitely not a comprehensive list. And you'll see here that I have asterisks next to some of these, meaning that sometimes these can be inherited in recessive or X-linked fashion. So as I alluded to before, um, depending on the gene, it may differ on whether it's dominant or recessive or X-linked. But um, in thinking of these, the main forms are dominant. Moving on to recessive inheritance, you may have heard of carrier status before. And what that means is that an individual for a recessive disease carries one copy of the gene that is not working correctly or has a mutation and one copy of the gene that is working correctly and is normal. If both parents look like this and have one normal copy of the gene and one abnormal copy of the gene, they do not have symptoms themselves, but are at risk to have a child that's affected with that disorder in the future. Um, so individuals that have that look like this and have one copy of a gene that causes recessive disease with a mutation and one normal copy um, are considered carriers, unaffected carriers. When two individuals that are carriers have a child, they're at a 25% risk to have a child that inherits both mutated copies of that gene um, and therefore would have that condition. There is a 50% chance of having an unaffected child that also carries the mutation similar to the parents. And then there's a 25% chance of having a child that is unaffected and has not inherited a mutation. Some example of recessive neuromuscular diseases are spinal muscular atrophy, most of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, congenital myopathies, congenital myasthenic syndrome, and the dystrophic gly glyconopathies to name a few. Um, as you can tell by some of the names here, most of these forms are going to be childhood onset or even infantile onset, um, some even presenting prenatally. So recessive neuromuscular diseases are typically going to present earlier and with a more severe clinical presentation than dominant diseases. Um, and that makes sense because for dominant diseases, individuals are often presenting in adulthood or later on in adolescence and are able to have children and therefore pass on that mutation. Whereas recessive neuromuscular diseases, oftentimes that's not the case. For X-linked disease, typically a mutation is inherited from an unaffected carrier mother. So you can see here, again, we're thinking about this as, as being a gene on the X chromosome. So mom has two copies of this gene. This is not my favorite image, but I kept it here for, um, because it was the same image series. But thinking here, dad really only has one copy of this gene and, and does not have a second copy. So just has the one copy. This is probably depicting the Y chromosome, but the Y chromosome wouldn't have a second copy of that X linked gene. So really, when we think about X-linked disorders, we're thinking of it as usually coming from a carrier mom who can have some mild symptoms, but for the sake of ease, we will call her unaffected. And when she has a child, she has a 50% chance of passing on this abnormal copy of the gene. And what that means is that she has a 
25% chance of having an affected male child and a 25% chance of having an unaffected female carrier child. And then a 25% chance of having an unaffected boy and a 25% chance of having an unaffected female. So this is um, kind of going to lead into our case example, but just understanding that there is this uh, sex dependent um, consideration here. Some examples of X-linked neuromuscular diseases are Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy, Charcot-Marie tooth type 1X, and X-linked myotubular myopathy. Again, most of those categories, subcategories of neuromuscular disease I went through earlier do have some X-linked forms of disease um, within them. So this is not, an, this is a very much an abbreviated list. To get to the family planning and neuromuscular disease portion of the talk, I wanted to start with a general um, definition of family planning. And full disclosure, this is really just the dictionary definition of family planning, which seemed to be somewhat consistent between medical boards, the, the World Health Organization, et cetera, or just different permutations of kind of the same sentiment, which is Family planning is the practice of controlling the number of children in a family in the intervals between their births, particularly by means of artificial conception or voluntary sterilization. I think this definition does a good job of kind of defining the overarching practice of family planning, which you might think of more as, you know, contraception and fertility treatments, etc. But this does leave some room for growth and elaboration in terms of families that wish to better understand or mitigate their risk of having a child with hereditary disease. And none of the definitions that I found really address this. And I think it's important that we kind of start to think about the genetics and hereditary disease piece as part of family planning. So genetics and family planning can look very different based on the patient at hand and their motivations and their um, where they're at in, in terms of their, their planning process. So oftentimes patients will be referred to a genetic counselor or a genetics group for preconception counseling in the context of a, a family history of genetic disease and they're interested in knowing what is my risk of having a child with the same disease. So that's called preconception counseling. Often what we're talking to families about in that setting is what is your risk to have an affected child and what can we do to better define what that risk is, um, whether it be carrier testing or doing additional testing in, to figure out whether or not you are actually at risk to pass on this disorder. There is also genetic counseling that can be done at the point of um, conception or fertility treatment. So particularly for pre-implantation genetic diagnoses, there can be genetics involvement um, at fertility centers to help speak with families that might have a, a family history of genetic disease and walk them through the, the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis process should they be interested in doing so. And then prenatal and post-conception counseling regarding the options for prenatal testing, pregnancy management, and postnatal care for patients that are at risk to have a child with a genetic disorder. So for a case example, I wanted to use Duchenne muscular dystrophy because I, I think most of us are, are familiar with that, but I will also give a brief overview of it for those who, who may have not heard of, of this disorder before. This is, uh, example is a female patient with a history of Duchenne muscular dystrophy in her brother, and she presented to her, her OBGYN for preconception counseling and was referred to prenatal genetics for further consultation. So the information that we would receive in a referral is family history of DMD um, referred for preconception counseling. To give some background on, on DMD and, and Becker muscular dystrophy, this is a disorder that's caused by mutations in the DMD gene. The symptoms can be mild to severe, and mild is, is kind of um, maybe a misnomer, but um, in thinking about this as kind of being a range of, of symptoms for boys that have DMD-related muscular dystrophy, Duchenne being on the more severe end of things where 
These boys are presenting in early childhood with delayed motor milestones, muscle weakness, cardiomyopathy or um, heart disease, and wheelchair dependent by age 12. Whereas individuals with Becker muscular dystrophy have later onset muscle weakness and cardiac disease um, and may be able to ambulate for longer. This is relatively prevalent in about one in 3,500 male births. The mean age of diagnosis is around five years, but as you'll see in a minute, that's, that's moving up and is it, people are getting diagnosed earlier, which is good because that means that treatments are implemented earlier and outcomes are better. Affected males typically present with delayed motor milestones, abnormalities with walking or gait, and then can have some learning difficulties or speech problems as well. But really the motor milestones are, are usually the big, um, the big red flags that bring them into clinic. This is a schematic that I'm not gonna go into too much detail about, but I did want to, to point out that over time, the diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and the progression of disease has really changed based on advancements in treatment, particularly in cardiac and respiratory care. So individuals with Duchenne muscular dystrophy used to die typically around 20 years, if not before, secondary to respiratory or cardiac manifestations. Um, and that's starting to shift, whereas many people with DMD are living into their 30s, some into their 40s or 50s, with the use of steroids and cardiac and respiratory care um, advancing. And I would uh, wager to bet that this will look very different in the future as more targeted gene therapies and exon skipping drugs are utilized for this group of disorders. Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy are inherited in a recessive, X-linked recessive fashion. What that means is that mom is typically unaffected, although some female carriers can have um, some cardiac manifestations or cardiomyopathy, as well as some muscle weakness or cramping. So it, it, carrier mothers are not always unaffected, but um, they are usually very mildly affected, if at all. And again, at, with each pregnancy, you're at a 50% chance of passing along that mutation, and therefore can have, a, with a male pregnancy, you're at a 50% risk to have an affected boy um, and are at that risk to have an affected carrier child as well. So this couple comes to clinic and brings a copy of her brother's report. And what it shows is that her brother had a deletion of a portion of the DMD gene, exon 51. Hemizygous means that brother only has one copy of that gene as you would expect because it's on the X chromosome. And there's a deletion of one portion of that gene which is the main way that um, this disease occurs from a molecular standpoint. Um, when we do the genetic testing, often it is a big, big missing chunk of DNA that causes this. So when we meet with the family, first our, our job as genetic counselors is to really kind of talk about that, that history and dig into what the patient's motivations are and why they're there for preconception counseling. So we would discuss, you know, when you came to clinic today, what was your hope? What are you looking to get out of this? Um, moving forward, what, what would you like to do in terms of, of your family planning, knowing that you, you are at risk likely of, of being a carrier and of um, possibly having a child with this condition, what are your, your thoughts? So kind of digging into that off the get-go. Um, digging into the family history and seeing are there any other affected individuals, um, talking about whether other family members have been tested for carrier status, et cetera, and then providing information to the family about the genetic diagnosis itself. Many times families are going to have all of that information based on lived experience, but might have questions um, specific to the counselor that we could answer in terms of, you know, what is the actual disease and what does the progression look like, et cetera. We can talk about recurrence risk just based on the information that we have in the family history, but then also talking about what are the next steps we could take to further define what that risk is for the individual that we're seeing. So doing carrier testing to see whether they are a carrier. We could also discuss prenatal testing options and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which I'll go into in a bit as well. This is an example of a pedigree. This is just a mock pedigree. Um, 
this is our patient here with the arrow pointing to her. She's planning a pregnancy. And you can see here that her brother is the one that's affected and passed away at 19 with an exon 51 deletion and a, a diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We have, we talked to the patient and she says, I don't think my mom has ever had carrier testing. I don't know if she has, but I don't think so. Um, my sister hasn't either. And there's nobody else in the family that has, um, that has DMD or BMD or any muscular dystrophy. So we would ask about all of that. So in this case, it looks like there's a negative family history. Mom hasn't been tested as far as we know, either has sister. So it's possible that this mutation is new in her brother and mom was not a carrier. So in some cases, a mutation pops up for the first time in an egg cell and is not present in a mom. And that is possible that that's the case here. Um, but more likely that mom is a carrier and that our patient here is at a 50% risk to be an uh, unaffected carrier as well. So given we aren't seeing the mom, we would counsel her as such. So knowing that information, we would tell her that her recurrence risk, her risk of having an affected pregnancy, just knowing the information that we know right now, is that there's that 25% risk of having an affected male and a 25% risk of having a carrier female. We would offer carrier testing to further define that risk. And what carrier testing would be is testing to look at the DMD gene specifically for that mutation that was found in her brother to see if she has that mutation. If she's negative, then her risk to have an affected child is low versus if she is positive, then the risk number is that 25% risk of having an affected male and 25% risk of carrier female. So knowing her carrier risk is, or her carrier um, status is, is very helpful and in, in really helping move forward their decision making. So she pursues carrier testing and it comes back positive and the patient does carry that exon 51 deletion. What we would tell her then is, is, as we've reiterated a couple times now, there's that 50% risk that she would transmit that mutation in future pregnancies. And again, that 25% risk of having an affected boy um, in future pregnancies. So we would reiterate that and kind of talk to her about what her thoughts were about that risk number and then dig into what they wanted to do next, given that information. So in this setting, we would talk to them in as little or as much detail as they wanted about the following information, including um, the option for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, uh, non-invasive prenatal testing for sex determination. And what that means is that should they decide to pursue a pregnancy in the future, we could do testing on mom's blood as early as nine weeks and look for circulating fetal DNA. And that DNA can be tested to see whether it is male or female, and we can know whether or not um, it is a male pregnancy. So that would give us information in terms of, of risk um, early on. So that's one option that we would definitely discuss. And then we would bring up the option of diagnostic testing through chorionic villi sampling or amniocentesis, should they want to go that route, um, as well as the option of post-birth genetic testing. So we'd lay out all those options on the table so that all of the information was available for them in their decision to, to move forward. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is a laboratory procedure that's used in conjunction with in vitro fertilization to reduce the risk of passing on inherited conditions. So what we see in, um, in PGD is that there is in vitro fertilization where multiple eggs are matured and received, and then the oocytes are inseminated with single sperm, the embryos are grown, and at the six to eight cell stage, a cell is, is biopsied and tested for the genetic mutation in the family. So in this case, if the family wanted to pursue this, they could do IVF, the cell would be tested at the six to eight cell stage, that embryo could be tested for that specific family mutation, and then embryos would be transferred that did not have that mutation. So that is, that is one option for some families. The other option, if they did not want to do prenatal genetic diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis rather, 
is to do diagnostic testing during pregnancy. So to um, once, once she is pregnant, the option would be there to do diagnostic testing either through sampling of the, the chorionic, chorionic villi, which can be done between 11 and 14 weeks, um, or testing of the amniotic fluid, which can be done between 15 and 18 weeks to look for the presence of the mutation in fetal cells. Um, and at that time, based on that information, they could decide how they wanted to move forward. And in terms of pregnancy management, we would talk about if they did do diagnostic testing and it came back positive, there are, are options that we would present to the family, including elective termination of the pregnancy should they want to do so. Um, there may be discussion about management of the pregnancy itself. So for certain neuromuscular disorders, there might be special attention that would need to be taken during the pregnancy for fetal care. Um, so it might be increased fetal monitoring or different interventions that may need to be done um, during the pregnancy, and that could be discussed. Um, a specific birth plan, so knowing that for certain disorders there might be risks with a vaginal birth and maybe a C-section is elected, etc. So that conversation would be happening in conjunction with maternal fetal medicine, but knowing that we would be part of that discussion and um, even in a preconception setting, we would talk about the fact that if the fetus was positive for this, there would be um, options for, for pregnancy management. The other piece is that many people say this isn't going to change whether or not um, I continue with the pregnancy, but it will, I'd like to know that information so that we can make sure to know what to expect once the baby is born. Um, so that can help inform the family and make it so they are you know, aware of of what to expect when the baby is born, as well as help the providers come up with a postnatal care plan. So for some disorders, there can be time-sensitive treatments. A good example of this is SMA or spinal muscular atrophy, for which there's a gene therapy um, option, and you want to treat those babies as soon as possible. So knowing that the child has that diagnosis prenatally can be very helpful for the family, as well as um, give that child the best outcome uh, based on early intervention. So I'm going to come back to this. In kind of wrapping up this case study, really what I'm trying to highlight here is that even in a preconception setting, we would have a very in-depth conversation about all of these options and kind of lay everything out on the table for the family to think about and mull over and therefore have all the information that they need to make the decision that's best for their family. So. Um, knowing this before they uh, are pregnant is, um, is helpful for some families. In other cases, what's happening is we see a patient that comes in at eight to 10 weeks pregnant and says, I have this family history, and we're talking more about prenatal testing and less about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, et cetera. Um, so again, depending on where the patient comes in, in their process, of family planning, this conversation is going to look a little bit different, but I did want to lay out kind of all of this information here, knowing that um, individuals that might be on this call might be at different stages of their family planning process and thinking about these questions. So when you're planning uh, a family and you're, and you're thinking about these things in, in regards to a neuromuscular genetic diagnosis in a family, there are some important things that I would, I would encourage you to do. First is to, to have an in-depth discussion with your family, if at all possible. And that is, is helpful to not only figure out exactly what the diagnosis is and hopefully get a copy of that test report for the affected person in your family, but have your family understand that you're going through this process and hopefully have some support there. And really thinking about this from a self-reflective standpoint and knowing personally what this means to you and what this diagnosis um, would look like for your family. So understanding coming into the appointment what your motivations are and what you would like to, to most focus on is, is helpful in guiding what is the most important information to get to you and the next steps that would be best for you and your family. Having a discussion with your partner is, is very important. Um, making sure that everybody is on the same page or as, as close to on the same page as possible um, so that it, this can be a cohesive and, and constructive conversation. 
And then obtain a referral. Oftentimes this is going to be through your OB or through your primary care provider even. Um, and a, a great way to do that is to, to go to the National Society of Genetic Counselors website, which I've linked in the end of this presentation. There's a find a genetic counselor um, resource and you can find one in your area and obtain a referral to a, a genetic counselor that specializes in prenatal care. And then again, come prepared. So come prepared with the information regarding the diagnosis in your family. Um, know your family history. Who is it that has this diagnosis? What is the actual diagnosis? And what, if you're able to get a copy of that genetic test report, that is very, very important to have. Um, oftentimes what happens is individuals might come and say, there's a family history. I have a cousin who has muscular dystrophy. And there's not a lot that we can do with that because there are so many different forms of muscular dystrophy. And maybe um, at that point, you know, we, we're left with maybe 70 different genes that could be the culprit there. Um, or it could maybe not even be a muscular dystrophy and this could kind of be a game of telephone. So knowing and doing your homework as much as you can and knowing that there are limitations sometimes in families and being able to obtain that information but if you're able to, having that is, is very, very useful. Um, and then again, involve your partner. Make sure that if both individuals are able to come to the counseling session that they do, um, and that if they're not, and it's only one person is able to come, that you are asking your counselor to maybe touch base with your partner and have an in-depth conversation as well, um, so that both parties involved are, are aware of of the situation and the recommendations and the plan moving forward. Some other scenarios and considerations. Um, I did want to bring up the fact that prenatal testing for adult onset disorders can be tricky um, and, and ethically a little bit fraught. So um, in some cases, neuromuscular disorders typically don't present until adulthood. I think a good example of this is maybe type 2 myotonic dystrophy, which typically presents in a patient's 30s. Um, if an individual wanted their ongoing pregnancy tested for an adult onset disorder, it might be somewhat difficult to get a lab to do that um, because it, it does get into the question of autonomy and should um, decisions about continuing or not continuing a pregnancy be made based on the diagnosis of an adult onset disorder. That gets into a, a very, I think, nuanced and difficult ethical conversation. Um, but knowing that for adult onset disorders, it's, it can be a little bit trickier to get that prenatal testing done. Um, sperm and egg donor selection I wanted to bring up. If individuals are known carriers, um, and they are choosing an egg or a sperm donor, they may want to ensure that that donor is not also a carrier um, so that they can, again, mitigate that risk of having a child with a genetic disease. So um, knowing that you can ask for that through uh, most donor banks is, is good to know, and a genetic counselor can certainly help with that. And then to touch upon something that I brought up a little bit earlier is the limitations that we have in terms of mitochondrial disease and, and family planning in regards to those, that group of disorders. Um, mitochondrial DNA is tricky because there are many different copies within each cell. And so testing both mom and testing baby can be difficult because we don't know that the tissue type that we're looking at has the same mutation load as another a muscle cell. Um, so it does, it is much more difficult to parse out, A, if you have a mitochondrial disease, what is the risk of passing that on? Um, the number's not gonna be as clear cut as the, the you know, the 25% or the 50%. It's, it's a little bit less clear cut and hazy. Um, in addition, doing any prenatal testing for mitochondrial disease is inherently harder and comes with a lot more limitations in terms of being able to definitively say, this baby does not have this disease or this baby does have this disease. So there's a lot more gray area with mitochondrial disease just because there are so many copies of, of, of mitochondria in um, any given tissue. And so um, again, trying to not get into the weeds of this, but just knowing that if you do have a mitochondrial disease in your family, it's still worth talking to a genetic counselor about this 
um, to kind of go into the, more of the nitty gritty details, but knowing that it does come with its own set of limitations and is a bit more confusing to interpret than some of these other disorders. All right, and then I have some time for questions. Thank you, Jordan. We do have a couple questions that came in. Let me see here. Okay. Um, first off, this person has a uh, collagen six disorder. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. So she is having a hard time, one, finding a geneticist that specializes in neuromuscular disease. She's got collagen six and she is conflicted on trying to decide which route is best to prevent possible passing the gene on to her future child. Um, she is going to be 35 shortly, and she just doesn't seem like she's getting the answers that she needs. No one really seems to be able to give her a definite answer uh, regarding like what would be her best route. She's wondering, is it safest to do IVF with PGD? Um, but she's, like I said, she's having trouble finding a geneticist too to help her. So how would you what would you do to recommend for her? Yeah, so I would I would recommend that she utilize this. I'll go to this link here. So um, this National Society of, of Genetic Counselors website has a great resource for finding a genetic counselor. And you can even um, narrow down your search based on the type of genetic services you want. So whether that's prenatal or if you want to, to talk to somebody from a neuromuscular or neuro standpoint, neurology standpoint, you can narrow it down that way. So I would encourage you to start there to try to see if there's anybody in your area that would be able to, to kind of talk you through some of this. Um, in terms of the collagen six myopathy, I'm guessing that you have one mutation in that gene as opposed to two. I know this can be caused is by either dominant or recessive disease. Um, it I think that talking to a genetic counselor in a genetics group prior to um, to pregnancy is probably um, well advised just because some of these, the collagen myopathies, they can present in childhood or adulthood and can be different within the same family. So I think that, um, I think you'd be able to get prenatal testing for that. I, and again, don't quote me on this, but I, I think you, you probably could. Um, but I, I think it would be, in, it would be helpful for you probably to talk to somebody in a preconception setting just to make sure that they were able to look into that and ensure that um, that option was on the table for you. So um, again, I would encourage you to use this, this find a genetic counselor um, resource. If you are not able to find somebody in your area, seeing a neurology group or a neuromuscular group is is probably your next best bet because they're going to be familiar with collagen six myopathies as well and can can t hopefully talk you through that or maybe even have a genetic counselor that works within their clinic perfect thank you jordan mm -hmm. are there any insurances out there that help cover any of these expenses with these expensive processes yeah insurance is a that's a great question insurance is everybody's bugaboo um mm -hmm. I will say that genetic testing is getting much more affordable. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is, is tough. It's sometimes very cost prohibitive and insurance companies can be hit or miss on whether or not they cover this. So um, we're moving in the right direction in terms of having that covered more often. But in terms of doing carrier testing or doing testing prenatally, um, insurance companies are starting to cover this more routinely. Um, and usually what I would recommend doing is that before you do the genetic testing, uh, if you're seeing a genetic counselor or a genetic group, they'll do a prior authorization or a benefits investigation to make sure that you're not going to receive a, a big surprise out-of-pocket cost. Um, but I think the other piece of this is many laboratories are starting to offer more financial assistance programs, knowing that insurance coverage has historically been an issue. So to make a long answer short, I think that insurance companies are, are moving in the right direction. More of them are covering genetic testing. Even Medicare and Medicaid are starting to move in that direction, which is great news. Um, and if 
for some reason insurance denies it, there are often other avenues to get testing that is affordable. Okay. Are you aware of any issues that families run into regarding um, choosing to continue an affected pregnancy, such as would insurance potentially not cover the cost of treatment for that person? I, that's a great question. Um, I don't want to speak outside of my area. I'm not a prenatal counselor and I, I'm not sure um, how the implications would be in terms of, um, you know, the insurance companies. I don't think they could deny payment if you continued a pregnancy that, you know, had complications based on a, a genetic diagnosis. Um, there, you know, there are complications in terms of, of access to determination services in, inherently as we move forward in society that we're seeing that more of that is popping up. And so um, if families are, are considering the option of terminating a pregnancy, I would counsel them to do testing earlier, um, possibly do a chorionic villi sampling versus an amniocentesis so that that diagnosis is made earlier and they're going to have more options for that procedure versus a later term. Okay, okay. Have you ever come across a lab refusing to do prenatal testing on an adult onset condition? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I, I think, um, so I've worked at a couple different laboratories and I think um, maybe some of the main ones that I think of are, um, you know, Huntington's disease or BRCA breast cancer risk gene mutations um, are ones that, that come up somewhat frequently for ongoing pregnancies and individuals want to do prenatal testing for those disorders. And some laboratories have kind of blanket statements saying that they will not do that testing. Um, and I have, uh, I have run into that and I, I've seen that come up. Um, I, I think that in some cases you can find a laboratory that will end up doing it, but it just might be harder to, to kind of work through that process and, and find a laboratory that's willing to do so. Perfect, okay. Um, all right, this person is asking, um, computer, as the infographic didn't quite convey this, what are the percentages of transmission when a father who actively has a recessive linked ailment has a child with a mother who is confirmed not to be a carrier? Okay, let me, re, let me restate the question. So the, the individual is a male who has a recessive disorder, is that right? The father who actively has a recessive linked ailment has a child with a mother who is confirmed not to be a carrier. Okay, yeah, so that I didn't put that graphic in, so I'm glad that you brought this up. So if somebody is, um, is affected with a recessive disorder, meaning that both copies of the gene in, in question has a mutation on it, that means that that individual, that father, is always gonna pass down a mutation. Um, so the, the child is always going to be at least a carrier. In this scenario, what he's saying is that the mother, the partner of this father with the recessive disease has been tested and is not a carrier, um, meaning she has two copies of that gene that are working the way that they should. And so she's always gonna pass on a copy that is working correctly. And so the risk of, of having an affected child is very low because we know that a mutation is coming from dad and a normal copy should come from mom, and therefore the child should always be a carrier. Every child should be a carrier and not affected. So the risk of having an affected child in that case would be very low. It would need to be a new mutation coming from mom's side and the one coming from dad, and the chances of that happening are, are extremely low. So in that case, I would say, if I was meeting with that family, I'd say, your children are most likely going to be carriers or almost definitely going to be carriers. Um, the chance of having an affected child is, is extremely low. Okay. And they just typed in, sorry for being unclear. They present with SMA type two and my spouse was tested and confirmed not to be. Yep. So yep. Each of your children should be uh, a carrier for SMA and um, your because your spouse is not a carrier. There should not be, an increased risk to having a, a child with SMA. Okay, perfect. All right, and we got something. Yeah, um, 
Okay, this person saying, um, Tara typed in the chat, for mitochondrial disease, I wanted to add the option of using an unnucleated, unnucleated egg cell. You basically have your nuclear DNA added to the donor egg, so that is a healthy mitochondrial. Is that a poss possibility? It is, yeah. So um, that's a relatively new advancement in which okay. a mom that has mitochondrial disease, again, the mitochondria being a whole, the mitochondrial DNA being a whole separate beast, um, separate from those chromosomes that I showed earlier, there's the option of using an egg donor that has presumably mitochondria that do not have a mutation, taking the nucleus that contains all of those other chromosomes that I showed you that we've kind of mm -hmm. been focusing on, and then putting that into that donor egg so that you have mitochondria that come from somebody who does not have mitochondrial disease and the rest of the DNA coming from an individual that, um, you know, that is having that child. So that has uh, the rest of the DNA coming from this mother. Um, so it's kind of a, I guess, a two mom process there. Mm -hmm. Science is amazing. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm uh, not sure how much, how often that's done, but it's, it's, I think, um, was first done successfully not all that long ago, maybe, yeah. maybe five or six years ago. Again, don't wow. quote me on that, but relatively recently. And I think there's hope that that could really be a, a, a big um, step for family planning for families with mitochondrial disease moving forward. Oh, wow. That's, that's Thanks awesome. for bringing that up, everyone. This person said that um, they just logged in or they logged in late, apparently. And they said that she is 30 and she has CMT. And uh, she's the only person in the family with CMT. She's curious if her future children have a chance of inheriting that condition. And I didn't know, would it be helpful if you, if you have to show another slide, that's fine. But um, regarding CMT, what's the process yeah. of children inheriting that condition? So it would depend on the form of CMT. I'm guessing that if she's the first one in her family, um, it could either be recessive or dominant. Um, Let's go back to the dominant form. So if it's dominant and you have a known mutation, meaning that you have one mutation that's been identified and the other copy of your gene does not have a mutation, each of your children would be at a 50% risk to also have CMT. Um, if it's a recessive form of CMT, okay, if it's a recessive form of CMT, meaning you have two mutations, one on both copies of your gene, then each of your children would absolutely inherit a mutation from you, but are unlikely, unless your partner is also a carrier, are unlikely to be affected. So would more likely be carriers for CMT and not kind of fall into this category here of the unaffected carrier child. So it really depends on what form of CMT you have and what the mutations are that are causing, mutation or mutations that are causing mm -hmm. your symptoms. And it's probably best to meet with a genetic counselor to, to yes. get yep. to the bottom of that. Perfect. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for your questions. I think we got through them. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, so I think that's it, Jordan. Well, thank, thank you, everyone, for your time today. Um, I really appreciate it. And I am always happy to you know take any questions if anybody has anything else. Um, I'm not sure if my email address is on this, uh, this information, but you're more than welcome to reach out to me. You can find me on the Neuromuscular Disease Center website. Perfect. Thank you, Jordan. And also, we would love to hear your comments on um, this webinar. So if you have a smartphone, you can open up your camera and point it at that QR code, and you can take a quick survey. If not, I will be emailing that. And then also, you can um, join MDA if you're new, or if you're, I'm sorry, if you're not affiliated with us, you can join us by going to mda.org slash join. And then again, as always, if you have any questions about this programming, you can email me at mdaengage at mdausa.org. So this concludes today's MDA Engage webinar. Thank you so much, Jordan, for your time.